So, um, there you are in John chapter 2. Let's pick up in verse 13. Listen to what it says. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and He found in the temple those who had sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. When, verse 15, he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he, Jesus, said to them, or to those who sold doves, take these, do not make my father's house a house of merchants. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. And so the Jews answered and said to him, Do you show answered and said to them, This temple, and in three days I will it has taken forty six years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he, Jesus, was speaking of the temple of his body. 22, when he had risen from the dead, he said, that, I'm sorry, when he had risen from the dead, his and they believed the scriptures, and the word. he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name. When they saw the signs, which he did, Jesus did not commit himself to them, because he knew all men. All men. No need. Keep your place there. Go to John chapter 10. So go to the right. Go to John chapter 10. Where are you right now? John Beautiful. Look at verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, that one, the same, is a thief and a robber. What is he? A thief and a robber. Verse 2. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. In other words, the one that enters the right way is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, verse 3, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4, and when he brings out his own sheep, not somebody else's sheep, but his own sheep, he goes before them. In other words, he goes in front of them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and will go in and out and find a pasture. Verse 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they, my sheep, may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And here's the key, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But, verse 12, a hireling one that's just been hired, one that doesn't care, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the world, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Your attention, please. The contrast, I'm the good shepherd, I give my life. 
the one who's just hired, the one who, who came in by the door, or the one who came in by the window, came in by the other way, he's a thief and he's a robber. And he doesn't care because when trouble comes, when the wolf comes, he runs. But instead, I jump in front and I give my life for the sheep. Amen? Yeah. Go back to John chapter 2. And I want to point, I want to focus in on two points this morning. As we continue our verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study in God's Word. The first point that I want to make and that I want you to take note of is that Jesus is deliberate. Jesus is deliberate. Jesus is what? Jesus is deliberate. He's not emotional. He's purposeful. He's walking He's thinking, he's acting in a way that's deliberate. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on how I feel today or how I don't feel tomorrow. He's, pur- he's purposeful. Number two, Jesus, we just read it, is the true shepherd. He's not a hireling, if you will. So the two points that I want us to ingest today, that I want us to take hold of today, as we look at our hero as we look at our king, and I keep thinking of that song, man, when the guy, the leper got healed yesterday. Do you remember that? What was, it? what was his declaration? I found my king. My goodness, that was so powerful. I was like, just man. I was just, I, I just couldn't stop just thinking of that and that resounding in my heart. We have found our king. Amen? Not that he was ever lost, <laughs> but we found him. And so Jesus is the true shepherd, and I want us to ingest that because as we look at him who is deliberate, who's purposeful, who doesn't walk and talk and, 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 and function based on emotionalism, he sets the example for us that we would be deliberate, that we would be purposeful. And as we look at him as the true shepherd, then I submit to you, and we're going to dig into this, that we also, as we look at our king, as we look at our hero, as we look at our example, we can say to ourselves, I'm purposeful, I'm deliberate, and in that process, listen, there's a genuineness about me. There's a genuineness about us that can never be questioned. Say amen if you're with me. So those are the two points that I want us to ingest today. Again, no rock star little... uh, We'll get back to that. We dig in. Amen? We dig in. That's it. And we let God's Word challenge us and rebuke us and exhort us and comfort us and guide us and lead us. No no self-help here. No... uh, um, you know, I, I, I. No, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's it. Nothing else. No, no branding, our, our, you know, our, our church. No, we brand Jesus. We point to Jesus. No, no gushing over uh, uh, and, and a great worship team. Though if the Lord gives us that one day, praise God. No gushing over pastor rock star status. No, but you see it all around, if you will. No, no, no. There's only one king. There's only one hero. There's only one example. His name is Christ. And that's who we point to. And that's who we magnify. We applaud. And that's who we follow. The good shepherd. Got your Bibles there? Look at verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Where did Jesus go to? Uh Up, up, up to Jerusalem, right? You saw it yesterday in that model. Jerusalem is up, right? And we even heard the um, Persian, remember the the funny guy, right? (laughs) Mustafa? (laughs) Hey, well, I was just, I was going to joke around, but let's not. Um, Mustafa, 
Mustafa? Isn't that the guy from The Lion King? Mufasa. Oh, Mufasa. Mufasa. Anyway, <laughs> Mustafa. You remember Mustafa? <laughs> Mustafa. Uh, Must What's the guy's name? Mustafa. Forget Thank you very much. Get it straight. One's the Lion King, one was the Persian uh, servant. That dude, loyal. yesterday, yeah, loyal to the end. Who can find a faithful man? For all proclaim their goodness, but who can really find a faithful man? And so um, this dude, you remember that he was, as he was um, narrating the story, he was like, and it was an endless trip up to Jerusalem. You remember that? And so here we see that, well, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus, in fact, went up to Jerusalem. And I remind you, you know the story, you're a well-taught bunch because we follow the word in the manner that we do. You understand that it's the Passover season. There is literally hundreds of thousands of people, amen, there gathered for the Passover. So it's a packed place. And I want you to notice, look at verse 14, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business your attention please once again where this was happening and if you remember at first when we gathered around that model i told you this those of us that were there i think the riveros were doing something else i don't remember but most of us were there and then later on when we saw the presentation you remember the court of the gentiles you remember that Remember how the guy went over and he said, look, this is where the Gentiles, then you have the women's court, right, where only Jewish women can go, or, or Jewish men, and then you had another court where only the men could go if you were Jewish, and then you had the other holy of holies and this and that. Oh, the ho Say amen if you're with me. Well, that initial court, that initial place, that was called the court of the Gentiles, and that's the only place that um, Jewish law allowed a Gentile believer in God, be it man or woman, to be. And so here, when we read that there was commerce, trade happening in the temple, that's what it's talking about. There's what happened in the court of the? In the court of the? Exactly. That's where this was happening. So, in a sense, these Jewish people, you know, they didn't think much of the Gentiles. So they figured, hey, let's set up shop right here because who cares? If these dirty dogs, which is what they considered the Gentile, that if these dirty dogs want to worship or not, who cares? So this is where they would set up shop. And you know the story. This is where you would sacrifice. They would inspect it. Hmm, let me see. Yeah, we'll allow it and, you know, pay us money. And then, of course, you had to do a change of money, right? Uh, regular um, coin, if you will wasn't allowed at the temple. You, you could only do business with temple money, right? So you had to do an exchange there. And I promise you that one dollar didn't equal one dollar, or one dollar didn't equal one shekel, right? You paid an exchange rate. These guys were scammers, man. Big time scammers. And Jesus walks into this temple, goes up to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. He sees it and he says, wow, man, we got a problem here. We got a problem here. First of all, you know that the Lord, He loves the Gentile believer just as much as the Jew believer, right? <laughs> Look around. You're all a bunch of Gentiles, right? And He loves you just as much as He loves the Jewish believer. And so He walks and He looks and He says, man, these people have come here to worship me, right? They don't know me in the way that others know me, but they'll get to know me one day. But this is being hindered. And in the process, this is highway robbery, what's happening here. Got your Bibles there? Notice. Verse 14, and he found in the temple, which is specifically talking about what? The court of the, of the Gentiles, right? And he found in the temple, the court of the Gentiles, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. Verse 15, and when he had made a whip of cords, or as some would say, a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. I want you to take note of this. 
Because here's the first point that I want us to ingest, that I want us to see the greatest example and by the power of the Spirit, applaud Him and then set our hearts to follow it. Jesus was deliberate. Jesus was purposeful. Notice He didn't act in a fit of anger. Did you notice? He saw what He saw and then He took His time and made a what? A whip of cords, right? It doesn't say that he just looked at the first one and he grabbed it and he pushed the guy and then he started going buck wild. No, he didn't do that. He took his time and he made a whip of cords. A whip of, a whip of cords. He was deliberate. I want you to see that. He wasn't reactionary, if you will. See, he came to heal and to save that which was lost. Amen? He didn't go about functioning in a fit of anger even though this made him angry. He took his time and he calculated what he was going to do because he had a purpose. Jesus did. Again, he wasn't reactionary. So here's the challenge for us, right? Because we all sat here last week and we all shared this. You remember? You all have it. You all, all, most of you spoke. And so that which you filled out, the focus for 2020, the change, it does, it's not going to happen by osmosis. It's not going to happen unless you decide and I decide to be deliberate, to be purposeful to put action to that which we want accomplished. Say amen if you're with me. It's very simple, family. If your goal for 2020 is to draw closer to the Lord, and one of the ways that you're going to do it is by reading the Word, well, listen, guess what? you got to read the Word. See, because there's a goal in mind. And because I have that goal in mind, I'm purposeful and I'm deliberate. When we were heading to the Holy Land yesterday, our goal was to what? Reach the Holy Land by 9.45, right? We were purposeful and we were deliberate. My car was, and all of you were too, because all of you were there at 9.45, even though I didn't think some of you were going to make it by 9.45. But that's what happens when you go from 75 to 90. <laughs> Guilty, 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 guilty. By no means am I telling you to break the law, by the way. I wasn't driving, and Mark was driving. <laughs> <laughs> so roll, homie, it's okay. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Deliberate and purposeful. Man, we had a goal. And so we did everything that morning to reach that goal. We all got up early. Daughter showed up on time, as she always does, right? She could have showed up at 6.20, but her thing was, we're leaving at 5.50. Her response, I'm showing up at 5.40. At 5.32, I'm getting text, I'm outside. Purposeful and deliberate. We take off. We're rolling. We're not stopping. But there was some big accident, so we get from Christy, hey, we're at a complete stop. <laughs> we all rejoice, because that means we can stop at the bathroom, yeah, we stopped. right? We stopped at Canoe Creek, hey, one, two, three, except for one that needed to go get a pretzel, right? <laughs> Let's go. Let's roll. Why? Because we were being purposeful and deliberate. There was a goal in, in, at the end of everything happening there, Right? And so therefore, everything was done to reach that goal. We were purposeful and we were deliberate. And all of you know the story because all of you did the same thing. And Pablis didn't go this time, but the last time that he went, he was purposeful and he was deliberate to get there at the time that he needed to get there. So everything revolved around the, the goal, that short-term goal for that morning. And so I submit to you that as you think about 2020, 
as we think about this walk that we're in, are you being purposeful and deliberate? And I got to tell you that some of you that I know aren't doing that yet, but that's okay. We're going to roll in the right direction. And, and, and so this is how the Christian life should look, purposeful and deliberate. I have a goal in mind. I, um, I don't know, I think it was a group of us hanging out, talking, or I don't know, maybe we were at our house. I forgot because I'm horrible with these things. She said, I want my crowns, man. <laughs> okay, there you go. She said, I want my crowns, man. You know, and we might laugh at that. We agree with it. We laugh at it as in, yeah, but look, there's a goal there. I want my crowns, man. I like that man part. I want my crowns, man. So my life, because guess what? I want my crowns too. So my life is going to be purposeful and deliberate because I have a goal in mind. What's my goal? I want my crowns, man. I want to be, I want to magnify the Lord. I want to glorify the Lord. I want Him to be honored. So guess what? I'm not going to dilly-dally in disobedience. I'm not going to dilly-dally by the power of the Spirit, right? I can't do anything on my own. I'm not going to dilly-dally in nonsense. Because what? I want my crowns. I'm purposeful and I'm deliberate. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. What are we? Purposeful. And what? Deliberate. And deliberate. Right? This morning, just this morning, I texted my wife. Well... We've gotten to the point in our marriage. <laughs> how long have we been married, Darius? Too long. Too how many years have yeah? How many years have we been married, Darius? Too many is her response. I always joke with you guys with that, right? But listen, we've gotten to the point of our marriage. We're getting there. By the power of the Spirit that, you know what, man? We've decided, listen, um, we have a goal. Our goal is to glorify and magnify Jesus in our public life, and in our private life. So since we have a goal, we are going to be purposeful and deliberate in reaching out that goal, which will mean sometimes being uh, patient, which will mean all the time forgiving, even when maybe you know, she's wrong or I'm wrong, um, being long-suffering with each other, being loving with each other. It's easy for me to look at her and, you know, it's easy for her to look at me and pick out the wrong, Right? Because there's so much wrong. But since we have a goal in mind and we're being purposeful and deliberate, now she is being deliberate in pointing out that which is good. Say amen if you're with me. Because we have a goal. We have a, we have a big picture goal and then we have a small picture goal. The big picture goal is Lord, we want to glorify and honor you. And then that transfers over to let our marriage glorify and honor you. And so we're purposeful and we're deliberate. Nothing is done out of emotion. Of course, listen, you and I know we'll, we'll drop the ball there sometimes, right? We'll be, we'll be emotional sometimes, not just in marriage and in, in everything, right? But, but we quickly reassess, right? We quickly reassess and we quick, quickly put that aside. And I remember, man, I'm purposeful and I'm deliberate. Again, Jesus walks into that temple, specifically the Gentile court. He sees this. Man, he could have done everything in a fit of anger, and still accomplish his purpose, right? Still knocked over the money tables, still gotten those people out of there, but he didn't do that. He was purposeful and he was deliberate. Remember the Bible says that um, he was tempted with sin, yet did not. Sin. Exactly. So he acted and reacted. He acted, not reacted. And that's important for us. And that's a heavy and deep word for us. I pray that it lands in your heart so that we would continue to grow and mature, deliberate and purposeful, man. There was a goal in mind, and the goal was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. And him being reactionary, though it would have fulfilled that moment, it wouldn't have fulfilled the greater purpose. Deliberate and purposeful. I desire to grow in the Lord I desire to have a stronger relationship with Him. I desire to put away the nonsense. I'm telling you about me. You, you go where you need to go. This is my desire in this, in this next season of my life. Therefore, I'm going to take the necessary steps because I'm purposeful and I'm deliberate. 
God is my all because God is all. That's it. That's that devotion that you and I are doing. Hey, it's about the Lord Jesus Christ, man. So my life, it's going to look like this. You know, purposeful and deliberate. And we see the, the example. Notice, and he found, verse 14, in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, which didn't take, you know, a minute and 30 seconds, you couldn't go to Publix and buy that or McDonald's and buy that or, or Navarro and buy that. He made it. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money. And he overturned the tables. Verse 16, And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Verse 17, Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Your attention, please. So, Jesus was pur purposeful and deliberate. The second point that I wanted to ingest is with th that is, was, is that Jesus was, is, and, for, for, and forever will be the good shepherd. Amen? He's not a hireling. He's not coming, acting. He's not playing Christian. He's not playing the Son of God. He is. Therefore, this is what you get from Him. Leaving that place there in John chapter 2, put a marker there. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5. And I remind you that as we look at our king, as we look at our hero, as we look at our example, because we have found our king. God, I wish that guy was right here singing that for us right now. We emulate him. We talk like he talks. We walk like he walks. We think like he thinks. We become more Christ-like. Amen? Amen? I want to share a couple of scriptures here with you in, in Jeremiah 5, Jeremiah 6. There's also Jeremiah 13, but we're not going to go there. There's also Matthew, but we're not going to go there. And, and let me tell you the, the disgrace that's happening here. I'm going to set the quick backdrop. What's happening here in Jeremiah is what's happening now today. The people don't want to be challenged. The Bible says that in the last days, people will heap up for themselves pastors. They will raise up for themselves pastors to scratch their itching ears. It says it very clearly. Timothy tells us that in the last days, what you're going to see is that people are going to want pastors and shepherds and, and, and friends that tell them everything is fine. All that you're doing is okay. Hey, you're in fornication? No worries. God still loves you. Oh yeah, part of that is true. God still does love you. Hey, you're in disobedience? Don't worry about it. This is why in these pulpits, this, you don't hear a challenge. And... People flock to this. They flock to this. So what, what Timothy tells us is going to be in the last days that good is called bad and bad is called good. This is exactly what was happening there. And here's the, the this is the, the backdrop to this. You got your Bibles there? Jeremiah 5. Look at verse 30. The Holy Spirit, through the pen called Jeremiah, writes this. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed. In the Stop right there. Your attention, please. What, what, has, what has happened in the land? A, a, land, a what? Astonishing. An astonishing and? Horrible Tell me again. A what? Astonishing and horrible thing. Stop right there. Right there, you would hear that and say, Senior would hear, me and Senior would be seeing that and hearing that, and we'd say, okay, there's been rapes and murders, for sure. So, so you know, a whole family has been murdered, and, and again, we're not trivializing, trivializing this, and people have been, and, and women are getting raped, and nobody's doing anything about it, because, man, it's an astonishing and what? Horrible thing. But notice what God says. 
an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. What is it, Lord? What is it? Verse 31, the prophets prophesy falsely. Did you, see, did you hear that? And the priests, in other words, those that rule, they rule by their own what? Power. Power. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? Your attention, please. So God says, something horrible is happening. What? Lord, tell me, what can I do? Should I call the police? Should I? He says, my prophets, they're prophesying falsely. My priests, the ones that I have called, they're ruling by their own power. In other words, they're telling you what they want to hear, what you want to hear. They're telling you based, they're speaking to you and guiding you based on their pocketbook and, and the big building. And, and, and man, we can't offend anybody. God forbid, right? They're ruling by their own power. And here's the other damnation that comes upon them. And then he says to them, and my people, they love it. Nobody says, wait, 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 uh-uh. What, what, excuse me? My people, they love it. They love to be told, hey, you're not married and you're having sex? Enjoy. Excuse me? That's not what this says. But they want to hear that. They love it. Because any challenge, and I run. Because men, as you know, including this man, we hate the light, but we love the darkness because there we can be, or we think at least, that we're hidden. And God says, oh, you know, Hebrews, there's nothing hidden. He sees it all. We all stand naked before him. So a horrible thing is happening in the land. Hey, got your Bibles there? Look at chapter 6. Chapter 6, look, starting with verse 14. Listen to what it says. I'm sorry, starting with verse 10. Same context. To whom... I'm sorry, real quickly. Go back to verse 31. Look at what it says there. In, in chapter 5, sorry. I apologize. Because I didn't want to miss that. After all of this, and my people love to have it so, the challenge is, and hey, what are you going to do in the end if you're living this way? Did you see that? Jump to verse 10 in chapter 6. To whom shall I speak and give a warning, he says, that they may hear. Implication? Nobody's listening. Nobody cares. Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They don't want to hear it. What they want to hear is, everything's okay. Keep going. God is love. They have no delight in it. Look at God's response. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in, Jeremiah says this. I will pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged, the old person, with him who is full of days. In other words, nobody is exempt from disobedience. None, nobody is. The older person, the one who's full of life, nobody is. Notice verse 12, and their houses shall be turned over to others, field and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And here we go. And from the prophet, in other words, the one that God has chosen to share his word, even to the priests, everyone deals falsely. They're all a bunch of liars, man. Nobody's standing up and speaking the truth. Verse 14. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Your attention, please. Real quickly. Did you see that? He says to them, hey, these priests, these prophets, you know what they're telling you? 
it's okay. It's okay. And, but it's not okay, he's saying. There is no peace, and you're saying peace. Wrong, he says. Completely wrong. Verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed the abomination? In other words, they're in absolute downright disobedience. Are they even ashamed of it? Look at the answer. No. They were not at all ashamed. If it was today, they'd be snapping the selfies and posting it on Facebook. Because there's no shame. I'm not ashamed. Notice this. Look at this. Look at this. This is, this is huge. This, 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 this burned my heart because I'm like, Lord, please don't let this be me. Nor did they know how to blush. In other words, they weren't embarrassed. They, weren't, they didn't care. We roll, baby. It doesn't matter. Therefore, they shall fall among those who do fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Your attention, please. Go back to John chapter 2. And so the Lord says, He points out these false shepherds. He points out these um, false priests. And He says, these people, they're not doing what I'm asking them to do. They fear man. They love the applause. They love the, wow, pastor, what a great sermon that was. Because you didn't challenge me. That's awesome. He says, but they were false teachers, man. They cry out, peace, peace, but there's no peace. Let's put that aside for a second. Let's bring that into, and let's make it personal. Because not all of you are going to stand here and share the word. Right? But the call is still to be genuine. Amen? The call is still to be he or she who honors and who magnifies the Lord. Because remember, we're purposeful and we are deliberate. We have a goal in mind. What is it? I want my crowns, man. I want to be told, well done, my good and faithful servants. Enter into your rest. You've been faithful in the little. Here's the much. Period. And then he shifts to these priests and these pastors who never challenge anybody. And it, we don't challenge to challenge. Nobody wants that conflict, but we speak up. And let me tell you parents that are here today. And we have a good group here. I know that. But let me remind you, man. Speak the truth. Don't say peace, peace when there's no peace. If it's wrong, call it wrong. Because you will give an account for that. The Bible is very clear that we see a brother who's been overtaken by sin. What are we to do? We're to restore him. But the restoration comes with, hey... You're off, man. You're off. You are letting crowns go by the wayside that have been assigned to you. Ephesians 2.10, there's good works that God has for us to walk through. He's already prepared good works in the future for us. Maybe this afternoon, maybe tomorrow, that I'm going to walk through that. Am I giving that up? Remember, purposeful and deliberate because I have a goal in mind. Amen? Uh, I, just the other day, I was talking to Vanessa specifically. She said, look, man, I got to go. I said, what's your goal? Man, I'm going to graduate. So because that is the goal, is she hanging home, uh, not going to school when she should go to school? No. She's doing what she wants to do because she has a goal, purposeful and deliberate. And so here we see the Lord as he walks into this uh, a Gentile court, and he looks and he says, oh no, oh no. I'm not crying peace, peace. I'm not going to, uh, you know, prophesy falsely. God has said this is wrong. And therefore, I, the man Jesus, will also say this is wrong. 
Say amen if you're with me. See, he could be just a hireling, but he's not. He's the good shepherd. And again, I submit to you that you are not a hireling either. Men were his, sanctified, justified, saved by his blood. You and I deserve, uh, the, we, you and I deserve death. We've cheated, we've lied, we've stolen, we've, we've, we've committed murder, some of us, with maybe uh, a, a, an abortion under our belts. Um, if we've hated somebody in our hearts, the Bible says that we've committed murder because he challenges, he, does, he looks at the heart. And we've been rescued from this, man. We have been set free from that penalty. We rejoice if, if the officer doesn't show up that day at court and we get our, our ticket done away with. We're like, fieta! <laughs> because the $30 ticket plus court costs, we don't have to deal with it. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the Lord, man, are you, think about the gravity, how much greater that which we have been forgiven for. And the penalty that we, that we had incurred that has been taken away by the Lord Jesus Christ. He truly is the good shepherd, man. And truly, he doesn't leave us to the wolves. He jumps in the middle, man, and says, uh-uh, no way. And on the same note, listen, I pray that your pastor is the same way. And I pray that you are the same way. That you would jump in the middle. Again, and not for the sake of peace, say peace, when there is really no peace. That there would be a challenge to each other. And I know we hate that word. Oh, I'm, I hear this sometimes. Oh, I'm, I, it's not my character. I don't challenge anybody. We, but that's not what the word says. It says to speak the truth in love, but to speak it. For how do you know that that person didn't need that challenge? And how do you know if one day you're not going to be brought in and said, hey, I showed you this, but you did nothing about it. Here the good shepherd does what he needs to do because he is the good shepherd. He doesn't lie. He doesn't, he's, not, he's not here for the applause of man. He's here purposefully and deliberately to glorify and honor God, the Father. I got to tell you, those of you that decide to go that route, it might cost you some relationships. It's cost me some relationships. You know. Some of you do. Some of you have been the recipient of my challenge. His challenge. Not, not my challenge. I'm just a man who needs to be challenged and is challenged oftentimes also by the Holy Spirit that lives in my house. Right there. <laughs> who will often challenge me, and I'm like, ah, she's right. <laughs> she's right. And so it might cost you relationships, man. Some of you have been here. Some people have been challenged because they're in sin, and, and, and you say, hey, I'm letting you know. And they go. And it's cut us deeply. But we're not going to be those that say peace, peace when there is no peace because a horrible and abominable thing has happened in the land that God says. And so I challenge you with that example that our king, our hero, our example has set that we would follow it. Deliberate, purposeful. He's the good shepherd, man. He's the true shepherd. And therefore we also should be those true individuals. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Let's move on. So he says, verse 17, Then his disciples remembered that it was written, After he did what he did, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Because he's the true shepherd. Verse 18, So the Jews, once they saw this, they answered and said to him, What sign do you show us? Since you do these things. And I think that was an honest question, you know, like, dude, you're coming here, you're, 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 you're tearing this all apart. We're already hearing that you're the Messiah. We've heard what's happened, that you turned water into wine and many other miracles. Okay, show us a sign because maybe you are who you say you are, right? So I think it was a genuine question. 
I guess we'll find out when we get there. Maybe it wasn't. You know, there's always that camp. Maybe some of them had a genuine uh, question, and maybe some of them were just trying to burn him. Remember how we've talked about that before? Right? Okay, so... And so Jesus, 19, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and I would say to you that he pointed to himself, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews, looking at him, they didn't understand. They said, they said well, but wait, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? Your attention, please. You remember the temple? We saw it yesterday, right? And so Jesus is standing there. I submit to you that he said, Destroy this temple, because this is what he meant. But I don't know, maybe the Jews missed it, maybe they didn't see it, or maybe he didn't point to himself. And they're looking right back at what's behind them, that huge Herodian temple. You remember? 17 stories high. Remember that? Remember? 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 Yes. So they look and they say, what is this dude talking about? No doubt they're thinking about the building because their, their focus is all on the physical. They weren't purposeful. They weren't deliberate. At least not yet. Maybe some of them became that. But their whole focus, because they weren't purposeful, because they weren't deliberate, was on the here and now. The material, the carnal, the right here, right now. They didn't, they wouldn't proclaim, I want my crowns, man. That wasn't going to happen out of their mouths. They would proclaim, right now, bigger house, bigger car. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Wrong with that if that's taken the place of your relationship with Jesus. Right? Because then you know, that would look and anybody could look and say, eh, not purposeful, not deliberate, bro. Right? And so here they look and they're like, what is this guy talking about? It's taken 46 years to build that. There's no way that that could be the case. Notice, verse 20, then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? What are you talking about? Notice verse 21, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. You remember that the physical man was indwelt by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen? So He was the temple of God, as you and I are today, those of us that are saved. Amen? Amen. We, have, we are the temple of the living God. So He was that temple at that moment. But He was speaking of the temple of His body. Verse 22, Therefore, when He had risen from the dead, it shoots to the future, His disciples remembered that he had said this to them. Ah, I get it now. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. The Spirit had reminded them of something. Here we go, verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, same time, during the feast, many believed in his name and when they saw the signs which he did. It doesn't tell us here, but he could continue to do miracles and signs. Amen? What were they? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But we know that at the end of John, it tells us that if we were to write down everything that he did, I suppose, John says, that there wouldn't be enough room in, on earth to fill out all the volumes in the books that he, of the miracles that he did. So he continues doing what he's doing. So the people are seeing this. And notice verse 25, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. Because he knew all men. Verse 25, and he had no need that anybody should testify of man. He didn't need for man to, somebody to come tell him, don't trust in man. <laughs> he didn't know. I'm, actually, he made man, right? Yeah. Notice, for he knew what was in man. So in closing, purposeful, deliberate, Jesus is the true shepherd, so should we be. Amen? Amen. We're not that shepherd. We're not that main shepherd. He is. But we're shepherding ourselves first and foremost, are we not? And here we see at the end that Jesus, the, everybody's seeing the signs, everybody's seeing the wonders, and um, man, they just, they're going bananas for him. You're the greatest, you're the greatest. And he takes a step back and he says, I'm not entrusting myself to man, for I know what is in man, especially unregenerated man which they weren't saved yet. Amen? For he had not died on the cross yet. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. We're going to close in prayer for the people that are listening, if anybody's um, uh, you know, locked in, listening. And then we're going to take a couple of minutes. I ended early. Uh, for those of you that are interested in staying, just to share a couple of minutes. It, just the fact that we don't have Will here, we should end early, right? <laughs> Too bad he's not here to hear that. Oh. Anyway, because he would love to hear that. 
Um, so let's pray, family. Lord, we thank you again for this beautiful day, your grace and your mercy. Father, your word, that it's a light unto our feet and a, and a lamp unto our path. We, um, Lord, we commit in our hearts to be purposeful and deliberate. I remind those that filled out the cards, Lord, that they would take a step back and look at them again, that we would not lose focus, Lord, in this short time that we have left. Father, um, again, we want our crowns. And, uh, Lord, we want to walk in obedience. We want to be good shepherds, Lord, true shepherds, even to ourselves, Lord. For I find, Lord, that many of us don't even guide ourselves properly. How the heck could we guide anybody else? Uh, Lord, so start with me. Help me be a good shepherd to myself, Lord, uh, as I'm led by your Spirit so that I can, Lord, lead my wife and be the man that you've called me to be to my wife and be, a, be the father that you've called me to be and be the brother and the pastor that you've called me to be, Lord. And, Lord, even now, by the power of your Spirit, stir these people's hearts, Lord, your people, to start with shepherding themselves, Lord, and that we, we wouldn't get to the point where we have seared our conscience to the point that we don't even blush at sin, Lord. On the contrary, we post it and we brag about it, Lord. God forbid, Lord. God forbid that that would be any one of us, Lord. For we're purposeful and we're deliberate in honoring and glorifying you, Lord. We want you to be magnified in our lives, Lord. For you are worthy of it. Bless us, Lord, with your presence as you have up to now. And we thank you for your word, Lord, that in fact, no cotton candy here, Lord. We dig into the meat of the word, Father, and we're grateful for that, for it's not this pastor that does that, Lord. It's your spirit and your fingerprint upon this church, Lord. We pray for those that are traveling and are not here today, Lord. Um, we miss them, Lord. Bring them back safe and sound, Lord, on Wednesday. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen.